Well, welcome. I am Kelsey Hall, and I wanted to thank you for joining Utah State University and the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service on our webinar today uh, titled Accepting SNAP as a Direct Marketing Farmer in Utah. Uh, expanding our customer base can be really important for any business that sells directly to customers. And one way that we can help farms or businesses uh, be more accessible to customers is by accepting our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program benefits. And I'm excited today to be your host, Kelsey Hall. I'm also a presenter. I, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because I respect the time and appreciate you joining today. This is our agenda for the webinar. We're gonna do introductions and then talk a little bit about our webinar series and the background about our farmer's market program and the project that we're currently doing at Utah State University. I wanna provide some background information on the SNAP program and let you know a little bit about the need uh, for it in Utah because of our current food insecurity. We'll address some of the benefits and the barriers to accepting SNAP, and that is for Beyond Utah, really applying to any direct marketing farmer in the United States. And then dive a little bit deeper in sharing about what are SNAP eligible food items, what can't be purchased, what the Double Up Food Bucks program is. And then I'm gonna turn it over to my co-host afterwards to talk a little bit about how you can become a SNAP authorized direct marketing farmer uh, through your farm stay and your farm store or community supported agriculture program. We did build time in for questions and I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to do that um, later. I'm Dr. Kelsey Hall. I'm with Utah State University as an associate professor in agricultural communication but I'm also an extension specialist and I focus on local food marketing I have worked 12 years now with farms, uh, ranchers and farmers on developing farm stands and community supported agriculture programs in Ohio, Texas and Utah. Those states are near and dear to my heart because I do come from a farm family in Ohio where we did raise a variety of uh, vegetables, fruits, chicken, poultry, cattle, um, horses, depending on our family members. And so uh, that also led me to see the need for uh, providing local produce and uh, food products to our community. And so since I've been at Utah State University for eight years, I have been working on SNAP acceptance and the SNAP education program and outreach activities at the farmers markets in Utah. Uh, I'd like to introduce at this time, uh, Teresa and turn it over to her. Hi, my name is Harisa Johnson and I work with the USDA Food and Nutrition Program. Um, I'm currently the team lead position for Work Center One. And so our work center, <clears throat> excuse me, our work center deals with farmers, farmers market, and what we consider like non-traditional retail stores. So that's why I'm on here today to give you some information about applying for the SNAP program as a farmer or a farmer's market. I've been with the Food Nutrition Service, um, Rock is what we called. I've been with Rock for five years. I'd had eight years prior to that with the state um, authorizing on the state level with SNAP. And then prior to that, I had some military services in the Navy. Thank you. And we really do encourage you to uh, ask questions. And we've set time for answering those questions at the end of our presentation. So we're going to ask that we stay muted um, as participants just to reduce the possible background noise. And so we're going to use the Zoom chat to help us respond to your questions. And then I can share a link to our webinar survey at the end of our presentation. So during that presentation, just please use the Zoom chat uh, to post any of your questions. Uh, Reagan Emmons is uh, the Farmers Market Promotion Program Coordinator um, at Utah State University with me. 
and she's going to moderate our questions and then ask them to us. And if you do have a question that Reagan can just answer directly, she will do so in the chat to just make things uh, be more efficient with our time. So let's just take a moment because I'd love to get to know a little bit about who's on the call today and just have you type in the state in which you reside from right now. So we have quite a bit of people today that have joined our call. We have individuals from Connecticut, Nevada, Utah, Maryland, Idaho, Washington, Hawaii, just really pretty much from everybody. And so thank you all for joining with us today. While this may be a focus on the state of Utah, much of the information that Teresa and I are providing are gonna be applicable to any direct marketing farmer or anyone interested in learning more about accepting SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks and their state. Sorry about that, I hit the button a little prematurely. So Utah State University faculty and community partners received funding from a farmer's market promotion program grant from the US Department of Agriculture in 2018. And this webinar is part of a training series that really focuses on how SNAP works for community supported agriculture programs, farm stands, farm stores, and farmers markets. Our FMPP grant team has also designed and implemented a statewide marketing campaign that encouraged SNAP participants to shop at the farmers markets and farm stands during our 2019 and 2020 market season. We've used a variety of social media ads, mobile ads, posters, mailers, bus ads, and radio ads to specifically target our SNAP participants from May to October in Utah to shop local at other uh, businesses. We've also done a little more outreach with this project through a farm dinner. We have had to temporarily uh, change how we're going to do those this year during COVID-19, but the initial idea was that we would host farm dinners and communities around the state that would allow for us to come together and work with SNAP eligible, uh, SNAP participants, uh, partnering organizations, government agencies, USU extension groups, food pantries, and other individuals, and talk about food security, uh, food access, and local food opportunities in their community, and how we can improve access to our produce in the, that community. This work really would not be possible though without us having some wonderful collaborators. Utah State University's Extension Sustainability and Create Better Health programs uh, collaborated with the Utah Department of Health and the Utahns Against Hunger organization on our FMPP grant. And together we have helped administer the direct marketing farmer trainings, we've promoted the marketing campaign, and we share updates on SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks redemption at our farmers markets and farm stands. It's been a great way to bring in several stakeholder groups that can work together on tackling uh, food access and food insecurity issues. And as part of this grant, we also established the Utah Farmers Market Network, and it's a work uh, organization where we help our managers of farmers markets by offering trainings, networking opportunities, and resources so they can successfully manage their markets and work with their vendors. And so with those four organizations, we have made a lot of this work possible. And they are uh, with us on the call today so they can be able to help uh, provide insight and be able to share information during our questions and answers too.
Now, I want to just take a moment and get to know a little bit more about the farm operations and businesses for those that have joined our call. So I'm going to launch a Zoom poll that's going to appear on your screen. And it's going to have one question. And I want to know if you currently or plan to manage one of the following, a community supported agriculture program, a farmer's market, a farmer's market booth, a farm stand or a farm store. So take a moment and if that is not applicable to you, uh, you can also let us know because we're excited to have you join us. And then just share with you where uh, we are uh, coming from. So it looks like uh, today we have representation for community supported agriculture programs, farmers markets, farmers market booths, farm stands and farm stores. Uh, we also have other individuals that are just supporters interested in learning more and we appreciate all of you joining. And I'm gonna use some of this information in our presentation to, to highlight things that would be of interest to you since you've shared what your uh, current business model is or will be. So our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is our nation's largest nutrition program. It was formerly known as Food Stamps. SNAP is federally funded, but state administered by the Department of Workforce Services in Utah. This would be similar to many of the states uh, in which organization or government agency would operate would vary. The, how it works is that SNAP um, eligible low income individuals and families would use an electronic benefit transfer card, even EBT card, similar to a debit card to be able to purchase eligible food at SNAP authorized vendors. And in Utah, our EBT card is known as the Horizon EBT card, but in other states, it would be referred to as something else. Food insecurity in Utah uh, does exist, but they're on par with the national average, uh, with 11.5% of Utahns, or roughly 350,000 people, experiencing food insecurity. And according to our last uh, data, that's nearly one in nine households being food insecure or struggling to afford a nutritionally adequate diet. Food insecurity is often a hidden problem and it can impact families and individuals and all communities, regardless of geography. And according to the data we have from the US Department of Agriculture, about 9% of those living in metro areas access SNAP in Utah, while 10% of our residents are in rural communities and 8% of those families are just in small towns. More than 85% of the SNAP families in Utah that have a working age adult also hold at least one, um, hold a, a job um, in the past 12 months. This impact is just really good for you to understand that as SNAP is kind of considered one of the greatest underused federal programs that could generate revenue for our farmers uh, as vendors at the farmers markets, farm stands, or community supported agriculture programs. And in the state of Utah this year, we had 24 of our farmers markets and farm stands welcome SNAP and the Double Up Food Bucks program in 11 counties. We do have a, more than about 40 markets operating um, out, via, outside of COVID-19. Uh, so with that, we did want to share with you the success of this year's season. We had over $136 redeemed in SNAP with over 5,000 SNAP transactions at our farm, at those 22 farm, uh, 24 farmers markets and farm stands. 
Uh, we also had over $110,000 redeemed in double up food bucks with 3,293 uh, transactions. This is a real success because we've seen a percent of change that's 26% uh, increase since last year. Many reasons exist for why you might benefit from accepting SNAP at your farm stand, your CSA, or your farm store. And accepting SNAP can increase your sales and expand your customer base. More customers would be able to shop with you and increase the dollar amount that they can spend with you when they accept the SNAP benefits and the Double Up Food Bucks. Your acceptance of SNAP can improve food access and food security for your community. You can also add to the health and well-being of SNAP shoppers by providing greater access to fresh, locally grown fruits and vegetables. Additionally, those relationships that you build with SNAP participants will uh, strengthen the sense of community. There are also increased marketing opportunities uh, because many states like Utah have groups that are focused around food access and they want to make sure they connect SNAP customers with other farmers who accept SNAP benefits. So folks with uh, Utahns Against Hunger, food pantries, the Department of Workforce Services want to increase the awareness of where shop customers can shop with their SNAP benefits. And that's going to provide additional marketing opportunities for you because these groups are access points to potential shoppers. And that is the case in other states where you can collaborate with those organizations and government agencies to help generate awareness that you're accepting SNAP and Double Up. Now there are some primary barriers to direct marketing farmers accepting SNAP, and they typically are related to business management, access to technology, financing, equipment, or marketing. And I want to break down a few of these and then share how we can overcome those barriers and make it possible for you to accept SNAP. The driving distance to your farm farm stand or CSA pickup location could prevent SNAP participants from shopping with you. And we have uh, two upcoming webinars, one that focuses on how SNAP works for CSAs and another for how SNAP works with farm stores and farm stands. And in that presentation, I'm going to share with you some stories of how the uh, those farmers have overcome the distance or location of their farm and were able to look at um, local businesses or finding pickup locations for their CSA in the community that made it possible for SNAP participants to, um, to join. Uh, your store hours or CSA pickup times could conflict with SNAP participant schedules. And so it's just learning a little bit about uh, what to set as your shopping hours and some of the possible pickup times that would make it easier for SNAP eligible uh, participants to come and pick up their share or be able to purchase products from your farm stand or store. It is necessary to have either electricity or a cellular service to operate a point of sale or POS terminal that's used to process the EBT transactions. And with the US Department of Agriculture, they do offer a wired POS system to direct marketing farmers and farmers markets when they become a SNAP authorized retailer. So that is one option. If you happen to not have electricity available where your farm store, farm stand, or CSA pickup location is, then you could look at a wireless option that would use your cellular phone to be able to process um, those um, 
the wire the wireless service to be able to process uh, the EBT transactions. The cost of a PLS terminal could be a perceived barrier for a lot of direct marketing farmers. And that's because it relies on uh, the cost. And they can be anywhere from $365 to $1,000 each. And there's a lot of different programs and options to work with and to select from when looking at what is a, a good option for your farm business. Both terminals and smartphone options require monthly uh, wire, uh, wire uh, fees. And then all of those options require paying probably 15 cents per SNAP transaction. And in our last webinar with USU Extension, we're going to address how direct marketing farmers can choose, use, and fund POS equipment if you would like to join us in December to learn more. A small customer base or a limited number of SNAP clientele in certain communities has been a barrier for some farmers, but we have found that if we work on good marketing, uh, business management, and just um, thinking about the location and timing of your farm stand, your farm store pickup, all of that could help overcome this barrier. SNAP eligible foods are consistent each year, and they can include fruits and vegetables, meats, poultry, fish, dairy products, even certain cereals, as snack foods, and non-alcoholic beverages such as coffee, uh, beans. Uh, seeds and plants that produce food for households are also SNAP eligible. It is important to know that SNAP participants cannot purchase prepared uh, foods fit for immediate consumption, hot foods, inedible flowers, decorative pumpkins, or inedible gourds, and pet foods, uh, as well as uh, beer, wine, liquor, cigarettes, vitamins, medicine, supplements, live animals, but with the exception of selfish, fish removed from water, and animals slaughtered prior to the pickup from a store. And then um, non-food items, such as cleaning products or hygiene items and cosmetics. If you do sell ineligible items to SNAP participants, uh, you do risk penalties, including disqualification from the SNAP program, possibly monetary fines or even criminal sanctions. And so um, it's good to just maybe uh, learn these regulations and then there's great context that can help you uh, to understand what you can sell and, and not sell once you become a SNAP authorized uh, vendor. Uh, one of the most frequent questions I get from direct marketing farmers is how it works. Uh, because maybe you've uh, been a vendor at a farmer's market that has accepted SNAP and double up food bucks, but it is a little bit different because what will happen at your farm stand or your store or at your CSA pickup is the SNAP participants will have their EBT card with them and it will be loaded with their benefits monthly. And you would just swipe the EBT card like you would a debit card at the time of the sale or at your CSA pickup. And then the funding is gonna be directly deposited to your uh, bank account. One of the, the last things I would like to uh, cover before turning it over to the USDA is about the Double Up Food Bucks program. The Fair Food Network works with partners nationwide on their healthy food initiative programs. And in 2020, Double Up Food Bucks programs were active in nearly 30 states at farmers markets, farm stands, CSAs, grocery stores, and other retail locations. And in Utah, the Double Up Food Bucks uh, is a statewide produce incentive program that operated in 24 farmers markets and farm stands in our 11 counties in 2020. The Double Up does help low income households purchase fruits and vegetables, as well as plants, 
and seeds that are for growing uh, produce in their house. The incentive program matches the SNAP benefits dollar for dollar up to $30 per market day, CSA pickup, or farm stand purchase. The Double Up program uh, runs from August to, to October typically, or um, July to October in our state. Um, other states will vary a little bit based on your seasonality and your market season. Our program has existed for seven years thanks to partnerships with several statewide organizations. The Utah Department of Health is the lead and they work with the Department of Workforce Services, local health departments, Utah State University, USU Extension, the Create Better Health Extension Program, uh, the Fair Food Network, and the Utahns Against Hunger, and the Urban Food Connections of Utah. And all of those are partnering organizations that can make SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks uh, more feasible for direct marketing farmers to accept. Now, to participate in our Double Up Food Bucks program, uh, direct marketing farmers do need to be authorized to accept SNAP benefits. And you will need a valid SNAP authorized number from the USDA Food and Nutrition Service. You must also have a working EBT uh, point of sale terminal and a current contract with a service provider before the Double Up program starts. You typically will submit an application to participate in the Double Up Food Bucks program in March. And we do have Hannah Martin with the Utah Department of Health on the call today if you have further questions about that. But without further ado, I want to be able to turn it over to Teresa from the USDA FNS to talk to you more about how to become authorized uh, SNAP uh, retailer. Hi. So just to go over just some definitions of what we as FNS considered a farmer's market, a direct marketing farmer and a reseller. So a farmer's market is a market a farmer's market is defined as a multi-stall market where farmers come together to sell their own individual items. So the farmers can come there if it's weekly, bi-weekly. The farmers have to be there to sell their own items. And those items could come from their farm. Um, if it's a dairy farm, any type of farm, any type of produce they have, but they have to be present to sell their own items to be considered a farmer's market. I'm um, a direct marketing farmer is defined as a farmer that grows their own produce and sell at their farm. They can also sell at the roadside stand or at a farmer's market. So you as a farmer, you're selling your own produce that you grow, that you grew, I'm sorry, but you can sell those at your farm, the roadside stand or at the farmer's market under one FNS number. Um, Go back to a farmer's market. A farmer's market, one market equals one FNS number. So an FNS number is the food nutrition service permit number. So that number is what you need to get these other um, double up bucks or to do the SNAP EBT transactions. One farmer's market equals one FNS number. Um, a direct marketing farmer, if you own one, if you have one farm, and it might be on different lots, that's still one FNS number because that's still your farm that you're, you're using. A reseller is um, a person who purchased produce to be resold at a fixed location or a mobile location. This type of um, store type is what we call them, is considered a fruit and vegetable specialty or a delivery route. So if you're not growing the produce that you're selling, then you will fall into the, the third category. How long have I been on mute? <laughs> A few seconds. When okay, okay. <laughs> um, so the next part is an FNS application. So to become authorized, you have to apply for an FNS permit, as I said, and the website is there. I provided it. Um, the next couple of slides is just going to take you through what the website looks like, some common um, questions that we have when people are applying for the program. So when you go to the link that's in the slide, it's going to take you to 
the page and I, I highlighted the bottom of it. So it's a regular retail operations retailer page. And so the first thing that kind of get farmers or farmers market um, pause is that we keep saying, saying retailer. Um, retailer is a term that is used at FNS where we're saying um, you're selling the items that you're growing or as a farmer's market, you're a retailer. So a lot of times people stop there and say, well, this is not the right application for me. This is not where I need to be, but it is. So you're going to keep going. You're going to go down to where it says farmer slash produce. You're clicking on that and it's going to take you to the next application. I mean, the next slide. <clears throat> So this slide, it has a, so this website that I provided has a lot, a lot of information on there about applying for the program, um, information that Kelsey provided on eligible items, um, different EBT information on there. So this site is a wealth of information. Um, but particularly, we're talking about applying for an application. So on this site, you'll see in the middle of the page, I highlight it. There is guidance, you can click on that. That link will take you to a PDF and it breaks down each one of the questions. Um, so I'm going to help with some of the questions that we're gonna go through on the application. But for some reason, if you still have questions, you can click on that guidance in the middle there and it will provide you with um, information on each question. Also above here, it says apply online to accept SNAP. That's where you're going to click at to uh, start your application. This page will then come up. So I put this page on here because there's three steps to complete an application. So the first step, it says get a USDA account. You have to start here to get your, um, to submit your application. So you have to do an account. You can go to the next slide. This is what that's going to look like. So when you click on that link that says get a USDA account, you're gonna come to this site right here. For the purpose of submitting an application, you only need request level one access. You don't have to do level two or any of these other. You only need to request level one access. So you're gonna click on the level one access and it says register right here for level one account. The next slide. When you register for your account level one, these are the questions that they're, that's going to pop up. This is information that once you go into your application, you have the ability to save it. So once you save it, you're gonna go back in and access it through the information you provide on this register level information. So I always suggest whomever is going to fill out the application, if it's for a farmer's market, that they remember this information because this is how you're going to access your application. If you have to save it for any reason or if you need to upload documents, which we're gonna to get to that later. And if you need to, you wanna know the status of your application, you'll be able to access that through your email and your password. This information is just for you. We at USDA, we don't save this information. This is just for you to be able to access your application later if needed. So you're gonna go through here and the next slide then shows you, it's gonna ask you for questions. So these are security questions. Just as this, this is just used if you forget your password, this will allow you to access your application. Once again, we're not using this information for anything. This is just for you to be able to access your application if you needed to update some information or if you needed to add something to it. So you need to answer those four questions. It will not let you proceed until you put something in there for each one of those um, questions. Okay, so once you get your level one access, sometimes people say it takes overnight processing. Sometimes people are able to, after they get their level one access, they're gonna get an email that says you have your level one access. You're then able to start your new application. I don't know why it takes some people um, 24 hours to process that and why some people are able to get right into that. But if you are within 24 hours, if you still don't have an email that says you have received your level one access, there's going to be a number that you can call and then they will be able to walk you through to see what it is. Um, it could be a computer issue or it could be something didn't go through with the first level one request. 
So now that you're here, when I talked about logging back into your application, so these are the ones that you might have started, but you didn't have information that was needed to complete it. So you can go back in here and you can continue saved application or you can start a new application. So for the purpose of this presentation, we're gonna go through the steps of starting a new application. Thank you. So this screen right here, this is the next screen that you would see after you submit start a new application. This is a very confusing, um, <laughs> this, is, this page confuses people so much. So I always like to include it in my presentation. For the purpose of a direct marketing farmer, you are considered for the USDA as a store. You are, and if you think about it, you own the items that you're growing, you own the items that you sell. So you are considered a store. So the first application you would click on is the store application. Right here in the small print, it says any firm except for a farmer's market should complete this application. It says it right there, but a lot of time farmers think because they participate at a farmer's market, they need to complete this second application, but that is not the case. So if you are a farmer, you're gonna complete the first application that is a store application. The second application is just that. It's for farmers, farmer markets who want to participate, who want their market to participate in the SNAP program. It's not a booth, not the farm booth, but the whole market as a whole. This is the application that they're gonna complete is the second farmer's market application because you're stating that I am a farmer's market as defined as a multi-staff, multi-stall market at which farmer producers sell food products they produce, those examples directly to the general public at a central or fixed location. So you will see a lot that we're saying fixed location, central location, because once again, one FNS number equals one farmer's market. The next slide. So this, the, I didn't print all the information out for the application because the first part of the application is just before you begin, it's just general information. There's an acknowledgement that you have to acknowledge that you are applying on behalf of yourself. And then the basic information is just that. It wants your name, your address, your phone number. What we do encourage is that people put an email address that they have access to. Put a phone number that you can be reached at um, and make sure that your voicemail is clear. So that way, if your, your call is missed, you're able to, um, we're able to leave you a message. So then it comes to this part, this screen that we're looking at now. It's the accountability information. This is information that is required to apply for a food and nutrition permit. So what we need here is we're asking for a farmer, we're asking that the owner or owners of that farm these questions are applied to them. Um, do you have any other criminal background? Um, have you ever been, have a violation um, at any of these other, have you been suspended or your wig or any of those other business integrity questions? This is applying to the farmer, the owners of that farm. If you're applying as a farmer's market, these questions are, for the person who's going to sign the application. So the market manager, these questions will apply to that person. Or if this market, if this farmer's market is ran and operated by a 501c3, well, we're going to want the director of that 501c3 information and they're going to have to sign for the permit. Okay. The next part of the application that kind of stops people, it asks about wholesale information. So if you are a farmer, there's a chance that you do sell wholesale. So you would complete this information based on your wholesale um, products versus your retail sales amount. Um, if you are a farmer's market, if you're applying as a farmer's market, you should say no to this question because if you think of it as a typical farmer's market, there's no wholesale being sold there. So some of these questions you will look at and you think that they apply to you, but they don't. That's it for this one. The next part of the application that 
pauses people, it talks about inventory information. This information, so you have to think, this application is for everyone who's applying to be a retailer at this for a SNAP permit. So this is for your big Walmart, your corner store, your farmer. We're all filling out the same application. So some of these questions will not apply to you as a farmer or as a farmer's market. So the first part of this application, it talks, it talks about inventory information, and I'm going to speak on it on behalf of a farmer. Then we're going to come back around on behalf of a farmer's market. So as a farmer, you might not grow or sell bread, dairy, meat. You might only sell, grow and sell vegetables and fruit. That's okay. So this drop down will allow you to put zero for any category that does not apply to you. If you do have eggs, we'll put one down for number um, 19 under the meat department. But for whatever items you don't sell, it's okay to put zero, but you have to put something. So if you, as a farmer, <laughs> so you get down to the second part. They wanna know how many, the quantity of items that you're selling, the variety that you have. So once again, if you're not selling bread, dairy, or meat, you don't have a variety of that. So that question would be no. But if you have vegetables or fruit that you're growing and selling, you probably have a lot. So if you have <clears throat> the example, it says three apples, three canned peaches, three. Three is the key number here. So as a farmer, if you are growing and selling um, greens, you might have three types of collard greens. You might have collard greens. You might have mustard greens. You might have turnip greens. Um, those are three types of greens. So that will be one variety. Then you'll have apples or oranges or whatever type of um, fruit or vegetable you're selling. You have three of those. I'm, I'm thinking as a farmer, you are going to have three of whatever it is that you're growing. You're going to hit yes to that. So then the next part, it asks about the perishable foods. Once again, if you don't have those items, then you wouldn't have the perishable foods there. Excuse me. I do apologize. Um, so if you don't have perishable items, then that's okay. You just put no. So any of these answers you can put no to if they do not apply to you. So as a farmer, you will have fruits and vegetables and they will be perishable. So now let's talk about this inventory information on behalf of the farmer's market. If you have a vendor, one vendor, that has a fruit or vegetable produce vendor, that vendor is going to have more than three items of each one of this. If they want to come to the market and make the market marketable, they're going to come with more than just one, one cabbage or one orange or one banana. So when you're filling this out on behalf of your farmer's market, you're going to think of it as each one of your booths. So if we're talking about one booth, one just one booth we're talking about that has produce, they're going to have everything in for the variety of vegetables and fruits. They're going to have everything in a variety of the fruits and vegetables, and they're going to have everything in the variety of the vegetable, I mean, of the, yeah, the perishable items. Hope I didn't lose anyone there. So if you have a someone who's at the farmer's market who is bringing meat, that they might have a meat market, they're going to come with just more than one. So you can put that in there as what items that they're having for sale. Sometimes as a farmer's market, this information is not entered in correctly. It won't stop your application from being processed, but we'll just want to get some information about it. Okay. We're good. I see no questions, so I'm going to continue. <laughs> so the next slide, retail sales amount. So as a farmer, you're going to put this information in either if it's a brand new farm that you're starting or if it's something your farm's been in your family for years, but you're just now wanting to apply for the SNAP program, you're going to give us actual sales. So we want to know from last year, 2019, um, what was your total sales amount? So for this information, you're going to put actual, you'll put the year, it'll drop down, it'll let you do two years, it'll let you do 18 and 19 at this point. 
when we cross over to 21, it will only let you do 19 and 20. So that will only let you put in information for the last two years. If any of these sections do not apply, you have to put a zero there. As a farmer, if you're selling and growing, you have all staple foods. So that would be 100%. As a farmer's market, this can kind of get kind of kind of get tricky. So um, what you can do is if you have a someone at the farmer's market who is selling hot foods or who is selling accessory foods or who is selling cold foods, then we're going to do an estimated amount because a lot of times the farmer, the farm market does not know what customer, what booth A is selling. They don't report, some markets don't keep a tally of what booth A is doing every Saturday or what booth B is doing every Saturday. So they might not have this information when they're initially starting up this farmer's market and they want to provide this snap for that farmer's market. They might not have this information. So as a farmer's market, you're going to give us estimated amounts if you don't have this. You're going to give us, and we have this thing that we call an estimated formula for farmer's market. We're saying that if your market is one day, if your market is every Saturday for four weeks, so you have one market a week for four weeks, and you have approximately, let's keep this simple, you have five vendors. Each one of your vendors is probably not going to come back every week if they're not making at least, depends on your area, but we like to say at least $50. Not talking SNAP, we're talking overall, they're making at least $50 per market day. That's how you're going to get that. If you live in a bigger city, then you're going to say your person is probably not going to participate in your market if they're not making at least $100, $250, depends on your area per week because it wouldn't be worth them to keep coming if they're not going to make a profit. So if for whatever reason you don't have the actual numbers for your farmer's market, you're going to give us an estimated based on that little formula I just gave you. Um, then you're going to put in the percentage. So if 100% staple foods, all the other categories is going to be zero. If you have, um, let's do, if you have 10, let's say with the same five. If you have five vendors, um, you're going to use the percentage of all five of your vendors are staple foods. That's 100%. If you're going, we're going to say four because we're going to keep this math basic. <laughs> so if you have four vendors and one of your vendors is selling hot foods, 25%. Okay, so the hot food section would be 25%. All the other, um, the staple foods will be then at 75%. Have two vendors that are selling just straight staple um, foods. One is selling accessories, one is selling hot foods, 50% for staple foods, accessories 25, hot foods 25. Hope you kind of see where I'm going with this. Okay. Um, at the bottom of this, this page on the application, there is a um, section that you can put in that says comments, additional information, and website. That information is very, very important to us. Um, if, you're, if you think that your farmer's market is not something that's traditional, provide us information. Um, if it is a farm and you um, want to just give us information about your farm, what you're selling, provide that information. The more information you provide in this application in that comment section, it's less back and forth that you will be doing with a program specialist because you have already let us know that yes, I am a farmer because I sell X, Y, and Z. Or I am a farmer's market and I know I completed the right application because I'm located here. This is my website. This is how many vendors I have. Okay. Um, so at the end, we've finally come to the end of the application for the most part. Um, like I said, there's a couple of things I did include, but it's really basic information and I, we don't normally have questions about that. So at the end of your application, you're gonna come to this screen. It looks a little bit different now because of COVID. So some of the wording doesn't quite give you the option to mail in documents at this time. So, but we have the ability now to upload. So as you're going through the application, you're gonna to have to print a signature page. 
A, sign a signature page is required for each owner of your farm or the market manager, or if the market farmer's market is ran and operated by a 501c3, we're going to want the director of that 501c3. So those people have to provide a signature page. We're also required to have driver's license and social security cards for all owners, farmers, owners, or a farm market that is ran not by a 501c3. We're going to require your social security number because at this point, you're applying for this permit yourself on behalf of that market. So you will be responsible for the market. So then ultimately, we're putting the um, FNS permit under your name. I'm going to pause right there for a second because as a market manager, sometimes that changes a lot. You want to make sure that you ensure if the, the, the market manager changes in the farmer's market that you let us know. Because once again, I just said that that permit is tied to your social security number. That permit is tied to your name. So if you're no longer the market manager at that farmer's market, you want to let us know because now we need the new market manager to apply. If your farmer's market is ran and operated by an IRS 501c3 tax exempt organization, we're going to want to get the 501c3 tax exempt letter. And then we only need your driver's license because at this point, we're tying that farm or that farmer's market to that tax exempt number. So we're tying it to the EIN number instead of a social security number. So we want to make sure that the 501c3 is aware that whomever is applying on behalf of that 501c3. And that way everyone is aware of what's going on. As a 501c3, if the person changes, we don't necessarily have to do a new FNS number. We can just get the new, um, the new director or the new executive director or the new person that they want to be in charge. We just need to get them a new signature page and their photo ID because ultimately the ownership hasn't changed for that market because it's still ran and operated under the 501c3. All that information that I just said, you'll be able to upload it into the system directly to your application. So at the end, it's going to request that you print out a signature page, but after you print it, you're going to have to upload it back into the system. You can do that via saving it on your computer, scanning it, um, but it has to be uploaded back. At this point, we don't have the option to mail it. For your application to be seen by a program specialist, to be in a complete status or to be reviewed, you have to have a signature page, you have to have a driver's license, and you have to have a social security card if it's needed. If you don't provide that information within, I believe it's 30 days, then your application is just gonna withdraw and you have to start the process all over again. And we don't really wanna keep doing that. So once your application is submitted, you'll get an email that states, congratulations, your application has been submitted. And these are the documents we need. Soon as possible, just upload those from there. It will then be assigned to someone on my team who would review it. Um, we like to reach out via email now. So if there's questions about your applications or we just need to get a clarification, we're going to send you an email first and then um, we'll send a phone call. But the first line of communication at this time is email. I believe, let's see what else we have. That's it. So we have a lot of opportunities to share resources with you. And one thing that we have done at Utah State University is to post uh, guidebooks, uh, best practices guides, toolkits that anyone can download for free from the Extension Sustainability webpage that's food. And we have a CSA module on how to accept SNAP and a larger curriculum for how to foster uh, community supported agriculture. We have a new best practices guide that focuses on social marketing campaigns uh, that encourage SNAP shopper participation at farmers markets. I feel like it is beyond that of Utah, can be applicable to many states. And we have a farmers market SNAP toolkit that's just a quick and easy guide with some great references that can help any manager. Uh, 
We also partner with the Utah Department of Health with the Double Up Food Box Program and the Utahns Against Hunger for that organization helps uh, do outreach to SNAP participants and helps advertise where to shop with SNAP benefits and Double Up Food Box at our farmers markets and farm stands. And that website address is also on this slide. Uh, Teresa, you've also provided some great resources. Would you like to share? Yes, hi. Okay, so the first, the first link there you have is directly to the, the website that I spoke about that have all the information. That's where you will also go for the application, the online application. There is so much information on here um, at that first bullet pro point. The second one is directly to Work Center One. This is the work center that I work on. This is a work center that works directly with farmers and farmers markets. So if you have a question after you submitted your application, um, you can email us here and we will um, respond back. We also have a message phone line that's checked throughout the day and you would leave your name and your phone number and your question and then someone from the team will also call you. So these, this is access for people who have questions directly about a farm, farmer's market or not traditional type of applications. Um, if you have questions about your application while you're doing the application, that's gonna be a different number. So that's the retail service center number and that number is provided. They're able to walk you through some of the, um, the issues that you might have when applying for um, an application. So once you have applied and you have questions directly about a market or a farmer's market, then you're gonna call us on Work Center One. But if you have questions about your application or the status of your application, then you're gonna call the Retail Service Center. I did see, um, before we leave my resources, um, I did see that there are some questions over here in the chat about EBT and um, EBT accepting online. This first, link right here is the USDA. This is the retailer's page. So instead of going to the farmer slash produce, you can just click on, um, take that part out and go directly to this site. There's information about online, um, the acceptance of online EBT. Yes, right now it is limited, but there is now a way to apply and there is um, steps on what is needed for that part of um, accepting EBT online. So there is a link, um, that website will, will forward you to that. And then there's a um, letter of intent that you have to complete. And then all this information is on that, that first part, okay? So yes, right now it is definitely limited. EBT online is limited, but there is opportunities to sign up for it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I wanna share with you uh, some upcoming webinars. This was just the first of a series. And so we would like to invite you to how SNAP works for CSAs or how SNAP works for farm stands and farm stores. And either of those workshops or webinars, we're gonna really dive deeper into how the marketing, the management, the SNAP EBT card process works, the Double Up Food Bucks process works, and give you opportunities to engage with farmers that are currently doing this as their business model so they can share with you great tips and lessons learned from that experience. And then our last webinar in December is about choosing, using, and funding POS equipment. We've collaborated with the Utah Department of Health and the Utahns Against uh, Hunger Organization on that webinar. All of these are free and we would love to have you register with us and join us. Uh, I will say right now, we are going to make this presentation available as a video with a link to the PowerPoint slides directly. When that's available, I have all of your contact information from registering in Eventbrite and I'll do a follow-up message with you. So not only do you have access to these resources, you would also know how to reach me uh, to further communicate about this. I'd like to open the, peer, uh, the rest of the webinar to your questions. Kelsey, yeah, we had a question early on um, from Christine about if you have one more than one location, do you have to have more than one FNS machine uh, number um, and therefore machine? And that's um, 
yeah, I was wondering, Teresa, if you could just speak a little bit to that. Yes. So currently, um, right now, if you do have more than one farmer's market, you are required to have more than one FNS number. Um, we know that that's a hassle. Um, you know, hopefully one day soon that will change. But as of currently, one FNS number equals one location. But to be clear, Teresa, if you have mm -hmm. um, more than one location, it's the location that's the important part, right? You can you can, if you have a, yes. a market and you're operating on two different days, but at the same place. Yes. Yeah. Right? Because, yep. Yeah, because in the application, it, it is a place on there that a, you'll let us know what days that you're operating. So in the application, if your farmer's market is open two, three days a week, you're going to let us know that. If it's seasonal, you're going to let us know that because in the application, it allows you to put January, February, March, whatever the, the month is. So yes, ma'am, you are correct. It's the location that's, a, it's the location that's attached to the FNS number. And then the next question was from Wayman and Amy Crone is actually on the call with us, which is great. Amy Crone works for MarketLink. And um, so the question is really around the technology around accepting EBT. And we're going to have our last webinar of this series, which is in December, that's going to cover all the sticky technology questions around this. And um, so Wayman, I hope you can join us for that. Um, did you want to chime in with anything else? I do have information on Totally Pay, a Go app, as well as the frequently asked questions for font from farmers and some tips on questions to ask uh, third party providers when you're looking at your terminal and your choice of terminals. Uh, my experience in Utah, especially with our farmers market, um, our farm stands, is that they already have a POS terminal, but it accepts debit cards and credit cards they are not set up yet to accept EBT so I always encourage them to not only apply to SNAP but to then call the third-party provider that's at the bottom of that terminal and then ask about being able to add the EBT card service to that terminal and to be able to include that or do they need to uh, change their contract or adjust what terminal they use so they can accept EBT I have a lot of resources because that's probably one of my most frequently asked questions from direct marketing farmers in our state that are looking at accepting SNAP. So I cannot help with that in the last webinar. So the next question is, um, what if you sell from your farm and sell at a farmer's market? Do we have to have two SNAP numbers to have EBT at our farm and at the farmer's market? No. So be, remember, um, I spoke about as a farmer, you're selling the produce that you are growing. So you have the flexibility to sell at your market, at a corner store, at the end of your block, um, or at a farmer's market. So no, in that case, you would just have that one <laughs> FNS number. Because that one number is still associated with your one farm. But if you um, have, if your farmer's market accepts SNAP, then that's their program. Mm -hmm. You're not affiliated with that. Yeah. There's no other questions in the chat. So, oh yeah, no, there's no other questions in the chat. So. Um, I do see one that says, how often can markets change the location or the address associated with their FNS? Is that something you could answer, Teresa? Um, it would be something that I would prefer that they ask me specifically um, because I would want to know why are we changing it so often. Um, so that, I, yes, I would rather for them to just email me or um, call um, just to see why we would be changing it so often. 
Now I could see maybe once if, like now during COVID, we have some um, people who have notified us that their market has changed just because where they were at before, that's no longer available or their city or county no longer wants them to operate that way. So they are letting us know that they have moved. Um, or if we have a farmer's market who is not gonna be open this season, but they wanna make sure that their number is still good, they'll let us know that, hey, you might not see any redemptions this season because of COVID, but yes, we will still, we're still planning to operate next season or later on in the season. Without um, further questions, I'm going to ask that all of you help me out. I have the greatest pleasure of being able to do outreach and education with Utah State University, but with that comes the responsibility of reporting the impacts that I have and what I can do in the uh, webinars and, and my trainings. So I have a very brief, less than five minute webinar survey that I would love for you to take. And I've actually um, have included it in the chat. So I'm gonna post that there. It is a link to a uh, Qualtrics survey that you can open and just give me a little bit of feedback about what you've learned, what your interest is in actually applying to SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks, and a little bit more about yourself and your, your operation. And if you would be willing to take that, I would greatly appreciate it. You can also access the survey with a mobile phone using a QR code reader or scanner. And this information does get reported back to Utah State University and to the USDA with our report to, uh, for our Farmers Market Promotion Program grant. Without uh, wrapping up, I just wanted to thank you for joining us today and being able to answer your questions. And hopefully you've walked away with a little bit more knowledge about uh, two nutrition incentive programs, as well as the application process so that you can become a authorized SNAP retailer. I'd love for you to continue uh, the conversation and have me as a contact. And you can reach me at kelsey.hall at usu.edu or at my phone number. And then uh, I want to thank Teresa for also joining us today and walking through a, a, that complicated process so well. So thank you. Yes, thank you as well. It was no problem.